the participants, but I, I have questions both for, for Desai and for Robert. Uh, and both of those were really, really very enriching and very useful. I'll start with Desai. Uh, it's the question for Desai I've actually written in the, um, the chat because I couldn't figure out how to get it to the Q&A. But I see Steve Mantis has figured out the Q&A, so I don't want to spend a lot of time. But Desai, the question that I wrote was the following, and I, I found it was really interesting material. As you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of your work, and I think it's extremely important, the work that you've been doing. So I have two questions. First, in do Transport Canada certification requirements apply to international seafarers? And my second question, if you want me to ask both at once so you can answer both. And do you anticipate whether mental health issues related to current conditions, the COVID related conditions where people have been on board for 19 months, for instance, one could anticipate there will be some serious mental health issues. Um, do you have, have you any information or ideas about how that's going to affect eventual return to work of those workers who've been on work for, uh, on board for so long? Um, and have you heard anything about this in relation to the research that you've been doing thus far? Thanks so much, Catherine, for the question. So I will first uh, um, address the first one. So the certification requirements, in addition to those um, marine personnel regulations requirements, so the table I shared that is an international requirement. So basically for our international seafarers, if they need to join the vessel, they need to show a valid medical certificate. So depending on uh, different maritime authorities' interpretation, so for example, like marine personnel regulation, they basically add several additional requirements or principles for this medical certificate. For example, like China, India, or any countries basically supply international seafarers, their seafarers need to have a valid marine certificate. So that is something Transport Canada's requirements may be similar to other countries. It's because they are the interpretation of the international standards. So for a second question, that is very, very important point because of this long service period, actually that inhibits many seafarers motivation, not just indoor seafarers, but even healthy seafarers motivation to return to their work. So what I've learned from my uh, interview with in, in China, and they basically decided to, to, to jump to another Korea, but because the jobs um, in the COVID-19 and jobs is still very limited. So some they do like Uber, but it's like the Uber Eats. So they become the Uber Eats driver or Uber drivers, similar version in China. But for the Indian seafarer, they basically, because they need this job to support their families. So even though during the COVID-19 pandemic, they know they need to serve on board for longer, they know they couldn't return home. They still compete for the jobs on board. So that's it's depending if their local labor market could create some alternative jobs for them. Some seafarers would say, maybe I may not return to sea, but if the local job market, the opportunity is so limited, there are still strong motivation for the seafarer to return on board. Yeah, and I hope that answers your question, Catherine. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a complimentary uh, quick comment on that. It will be interesting to track the certification processes to see if they write in mental health issues into the script in light of the pandemic and the consequences to mental health. Uh, but that, that's more a, a regulatory research question. Are they gonna yeah. get new rules or are they gonna put a blind eye to this because otherwise there will be no more seafarers. So I'm yeah. gonna, Barb, I'm gonna stop. I have a question for Rob, but I see that there's others who have questions. Um, and I'll come back for Rob um, after the questions are asked. Sure, thanks, Catherine. So we have a question from Steve Mantis. Uh, Steve says, thank you, Robert, for your presentation. One question I have is, have you looked at the actual experience these workers had compared to workers' compensation board data, especially for more serious and longer duration injuries and disabilities? It seems there's often a significant gap between actual disability days and days on workers' compensation board benefits. Yeah, thanks for that question, Steve. It's, it's a really good question. Um, the short answer is I have not looked at that. Um, most of the research I've done personally has only been working with um, data, which is in the workers' compensation system, and particularly those that would be the, the length of time they're on uh, loss of earnings benefits or wage replacement benefits. So 
And this is something which we could potentially be looking at a little bit, a bit of a broader scope in terms of um, uh, when we do the, the new research in BC. But I think really to get to get at that kind of question and um, to look at sort of discrepancies between days paid and actual days that are actually disabled, you're going to have to start looking at other information uh, outside of the compensation system and actually speaking to these workers, potentially conducting surveys with them. So. Um, we know just even from other research, uh, other research, not necessarily looking at interjurisdictional workers, that there's there's big differences which can, you know, in terms of what people are paid for and when they're actually disabled, based on how they claim and what they're eligible for, and in terms of their compensation benefits. Uh, hopefully that at least partially answers the question. Well, we have another question from Steve. Or is for both presenters. I'm sorry, I just have to move it. Well, another question is what factors might influence whether the return to work is both safe and sustainable? There seems to be a significant experience of work re injury for those workers with long duration disability, not even looking at mental health factors. So, decide you want to respond first, and then we could go to Robert. Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. It's a very important uh, question. So, the, it's um, for for seafarers. This group is um, I would say is a kind of um, uh, balance between safety and the return to work or reemployment of the seafarers. So, um, in addition to the presentation, I the finding I shared. So, in my um, in some some captains and chief engineer, they have actually complained another side of this medical certificate. So basically because the medical certificate, once it's issued, it will be valid for two years. And in previous years, these captain and chief engineers uh, have the injured seafarers with a broken leg or broken arms being sent by the workers' compensation board on the, on the vessels. And then that basically with the inquiry about how could these seafarers, basically they are with limit, physical limitations to operate those uh, physical demanding jobs on board. So in that case, that is a tricky situation. Either we send them back on the workers' compensation benefits or other employment assistance program, or we need to sacrifice some safety uh, issues on board. So in that case, for those factors um, to make uh, could make the could make this return to work safe and sustainable. First, I think it's a good communication between the specialist of the, uh, the doctors and specialists and the transport workers, marine medical examiner. So they need to basically from a medical perspective to ensure that person is competent to return to work and operate the work safely. And second thing is for this um, working environment on board. It's sure it's an, I would say it's a, a industry with a reputation of high risk industry. So that even though we still to empower women disabled people to return to work or to join this industry, it's very hard for them to adapt to this working environment. So this working environment due to some commercial reasons or historical reasons is is very male dominated or the whole construct, the, the working environment is constructed from a very male dominated perspective. So in that case, if that is still the working environment and could not be changed or improved, then it's very hard to have a sustainable return to work. But nowadays we are facing a shortage of seafarers in Canada, and that is basically a very important issue today. So there are two ways to go. One is to promote unmanned or autonomous vessels and to further reduce the labor force. On the other hand, is that to improve the working environment, to make it more safe or friendly, an uh, environment, a friendly environment for the people who with working, who with the uh, physical limitation could do some job. Or the third way is we can probably to create some other channels for the seafarer to do some maritime related jobs ashore rather than going back. Uh, going back to, to, to the vessels, if these vessels were in our still to be hazardous and risky. So that's basically my, my, my interpretation for this question and hope that answers the question. Thanks. Thanks. Desai, Robert, do you want to respond to Steve's uh, I, question? I, I, I agree with what Desai is saying in terms of like the, the role of the communication 
uh, between the workers, the healthcare providers, uh, also like the case management and employers. But um, yeah, trying to make sure you actually reduce what was causing the injury in the first place. If it was some poor like hazard management at the workplace, if you don't fix that problem, you're going to run the risk of the same injury occurring again. Um, but uh, in terms of sustainable return to work, um, it's important to make sure that the return to work, the worker can return to that job. And if they can't, you have to find them another job. Otherwise it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to be sustainable in the long run. So, so that's, that's what I would add uh, to what this uh, has already said. Okay, thanks. So we have another question from Dawn. It's for you, Desai. Is there any data on how often seafarers need to be medically evacuated from their ship and the reason why? If not, how could this data be collected? Perhaps from air ambulance services, for example? Thanks, Don, for this question. So, um, so there is a basically some data holders of these telemedical uh, service lines. So basically how frequent, how often they need to be medically evacuated, probably don't have the data, but there is the published um, data on the uh, cases. So during a certain year period in one telemedical uh, provider, how many uh, medical uh, inquiries they have received. So in that case, it's uh, basically in different telemedical providers, they hold such data. So for the air ambulance services, um, yes, I would say, but that is for the most emergent uh, medical situation on board the vessel. But for some general medical issues, usually the first level is the chief officer who is taking charge, uh, taking charge of the medical chest on board. So they can give some, um, let's say, common prescription to their seafarers for some um, small, um, not very urgent medical issues. And the second level is that the company usually have a telemedical service uh, company, so there will be a nurse on the phone. So basically, they call that and then they give some feedback, some comments. And the third level is that there is a real urgent, emergent uh, medical need, for example, like strokes. And then in that case, usually the uh, captain will write to the agency in port and ask for port-based uh, medical resources because that is something could not be dealt on board the vessel. So um, yes, Don, you're right. So there are some data collected, but by private data holders. And uh, to get access to that data sometimes is very challenging and uh, they may not, uh, because they are private uh, medical care providers, so they may not be willing to share such data with us. Yeah. Thank you, Don. And Catherine, you had another question, I think, for Robert this time? Yes, I, I do. Um, Robert, you, first of all, really interesting presentation, really useful research. Uh, and I, you might have, partially answered my question. I'll tell you what my, yeah, and I'm a, a come at this from a policy perspective, as you well know. Um, so my question was, do you have information on where the workers are during their claims? Because it's one thing to be a resident in another province, but it doesn't mean that they don't have a temporary residence in Alberta, for instance. Um, and of course, when I say, I think you partially answered that, well, the healthcare provision if you were looking at that, that would give a clue as to whether they were being treated in their home promise or treated in the province in which they are working. But uh, I, I don't, I'm trying to imagine how else you could find that out because it, of course, I think, it, I think it's really one way or the other is very, very important and interesting for policymakers to understand why there is this gap. And it might be, just as plausible that it's because they're far away from their families while they're ill and that exacerbates the their, their medical condition or it can be that they're so far away from their work that there's no point in going back uh, people i've interviewed who uh or cases i have seen where they have suggested that somebody could do two hours of work a day and they say well i'm not going to travel 24 hours to do two hours and then to stay in a barrack um and, and not have any health care because even the doctors are far away from the workplace. So, and I, I sort of echo what Steve was suggesting, which is the qualitative information necessary to understand what's going on um, is one thing, but also from a quantitative perspective, um, you mentioned the healthcare that Nicola managed to, to tease out in the study that she did. 
Um, how could you find out where these people are during their convalescence period uh, without actually speaking with them? Do you, have you addressed that? Can you imagine how you could do that? Yeah, it's, um, yeah basically there's, um, there's different kind of indicators of you know, mobile workers depending on the files you look at in the data. So you've got, we've got payment transactions. So within that, you can actually see, you know, during one particular week, they had time loss benefits. And you can actually, in some provinces, they separate that out between time loss benefits, which are being reimbursed for interjurisdictional claims versus those that are, are not. Um, but you also have healthcare benefits broken down that way too, which is how Nicola and the team were able to do that in Alberta. And you can actually do that in BC and you can also do it in Saskatchewan, I think, but it's, I think it was in Manitoba or New Brunswick, which we couldn't do it. Um, and there's also, yeah, there's the, the, there's a residential postal code, which we relied on, which is, I think basically they probably have it assigned to the injured worker file in their database. And then that might be updated over time. So unless there's other internal, like the administrative record of when that's changed, um, that's something which you could look into, but I think um, there is the operating location of the employers. For some employers within some particular industries, you probably just know based on the name of the employer and location. If it's if it's up north in remote area of BC, you probably have a good idea that it's actually a, a work camp for like a you know a mining company or forestry or something like that. Um, but I think particularly if they're receiving medical treatment. Um, you should be able to have records based on their medical, if you link the medical records and the compensation records, that would give you several time points if, it, if there's any changes in terms of uh, their, their location. Um, but in terms of, yeah, if there's temporary residence, temporary residences, or if they, if they include the residence of their employer as opposed to their permanent residence, like at home, it's difficult to really it's difficult to really know that unless unless the compensation boards can collect more information on that in which case i like the other question is whether they would give us access to that data as well so um yeah. and it's did you bob can i ask another question yeah well i've just discovered there was one further down that i hadn't noticed but you go, you go ahead it's, there's only one other that i can see at the moment just a follow-up question um, Rob, you've, you've looked at interprovincial, but supposing that the residence is 500 kilometers away in the same province, is this something that you've been able to look at in this study? And if not, could you, if you, so for instance, somebody who's, whose residence is in Vancouver, but who's been working in, in, in the North, um, that's almost as problematic possibly as somebody whose residence is in um, a different province, but maybe only 200 kilometers uh, by road. Away. Yes, that's a great question. Um, we have not been able to account for that in this study, um, but we should be able to at least try and control for that in our in our new work because we're only focusing on BC data. So um, a lot of the other provinces, we maybe just had an employer address, which could be their head office location, which may not even be the same province as, as for the work. But in BC data, we have the operating location as well as the employer sort of file. So there's address information for both of them. So I think if we focus in on sectors where you expect there to could be this kind of remote work, then we should be able to do a kind of comparison like that. It would be really, be really interesting to see if actually the difference is not nothing to do with the well not nothing to do, but less likely to do with the jurisdiction, but actually the distance is driving the driving the the problem. Well, I guess I guess a thing to add is actually we did a, we have done a separate study looking at the differences in disability duration between urban and rural areas as well. I guess that doesn't take into account your it doesn't really take into account your where you work. It's based on an aggregation of your where you live based on commuter patterns. But um, so it's almost like we've kind of partially partially adjusted for it in the model. But something we want to do more okay. correctly in our next our next research. So. Very interesting. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next question is for Desai. Uh, Desai, I don't know if you can see it. It's from uh, Yasprit Sur. And it says, Desai, in your research, did you touch on how seafarer employers get registered with Transport Canada? Okay, so what I can explain is about the vessel registration in Canada. So 
normally it's like, uh, for example, like the seafarers, um, not the seafarers, the vessels doing Canadian Arctic voyages. So they're usually doing that uh, during the summer. Well, uh, when they are in the winter, so they registered another flag of convenience, such as Panama or Bahama, and then they operate in international voyages. But when they need to do the Arctic voyages, they need to do domestic trade, uh, cabotage trade, then they registered with Transport Canada again. So it's more like a, a, um, a vessel registered in Canada rather than a employer yeah, registered. So the uh, employer registered as the ship owner or the ship manager in that sense. So I hope that answer just great question. If you, if I get your question, uh, I, I get what you mean right. So if not, you could probably further have some chat in the chat box. Okay, okay I, well, maybe I have another question in case while we, we wait to see if there are any others. Um, does I how many seafarers have actually gotten COVID? Do we have any idea of that? Because um, COVID, lots of people seem to have post-COVID problems. If they get COVID, what happens to them? Yeah. So for that question, uh, as per the union's uh, representative's account in last December, last November, so for the 2020 uh, shipping season, they have. Uh, received about 10 cases. So 10 cases of one union, uh, basically their members reported 10 cases. So basically in that case, um, after those 10 cases diagnosed, so the whole uh, crew on board need to be quarantined and isolated. So that's it's a quite huge interruption of the supply chain. So for some other shipping companies, what I learned from them is that they do the uh, COVID-19 test and after the test, they uh, require their seafarers to have self-quarantine before they join the vessel. So that makes sure that all of the people joining the vessel could be uh, COVID-19 free. And that is even more important for those visitors, including pilots, stevedores, to follow the COVID-19 protocol. So that's it's basically a, a issue here. So they have 10 cases diagnosis, but once it's diagnosed on board, all the other people expo have the exposure would be also at high risk. Yeah. There are some more questions. <laughs> um, Dawn followed up with decide as your research encompass the commercial fishing industry. Uh, this might include many small domestic operators whose return to work challenges may be very different from international cargo shipping companies. Uh, and so depending on your sample size, would you plan to separate these two groups in your research data? Okay, thanks, Tom. That's an excellent question. So I have another, um, I have another master student who is doing a research project on my uh, supervisions about noise exposure on the commercial, in the commercial fishing industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, that basically there are many small domestic operators and those uh, vessels usually are not regulated by Transport Canada because they are below 15 gross tonnage or uh, uh, shorter than um, 20, 24 meters. So there is a two threshold to be regulated by Transport Canada. So one is the tonnage and the other is the length of the vessel. So for them, they are, uh, domestic operator than their return to work challenges. So they do not need medical certificate in, mo in let's say, for those small uh, fishing vessels, if their crew are not licensed, then they do not need medical certificates. So their return to work challenges would be very different from the international uh, cargo shipping companies. And uh, we do have a plan to uh, focus on the fishing harvesters return to work in Newfoundland, probably due to the COVID-19 disruption. So we probably could initiate that project next year. So that is focused on uh, fishing harvesters, that group. Thanks. And uh, Robert, there's a question for you from Jess Ponting. Thank you for your presentations. It would be interesting to see what the actual return to work outcomes are between interjurisdictional inter workers. Uh, disability slash claims duration does not equate to return to work. Yeah, that's I, I agree with that point. That's that's what I made in the 
the inner limitations is because we're only looking at this cumulative measure of disability is paid it's not doesn't equate to return to work some of these people on long like long duration claims are maybe never going to return to work so that's where we need to actually use other measures of return to work whether it's with the same employer same job modified duties um, which I hope we can act, we will be doing that in BC. We'll probably use those, those measures as opposed to the days paid measures um, when we do that work. And Desai, another question for you. What role do you think it's IBO? What role do you think trade unions play in ensuring the rights of seafarers are protected compared to the ILO? Yeah, I think trade unions uh, play very, very important role. So basically first, um, in, in 2020, uh, both of the Canadian uh, trade union, the seafarers and the representative, the International Transport Workers Federation, so that is the union's federation, their representatives in Canada, they worked very hard to uh, require at the very beginning of the pandemic to uh, ask the Canadian government to uh, basically to design it this key workers uh, status essential worker status for seafarers and Transport Canada and respond also very quickly to this request and first to design uh, basically ensure that seafarers have the essential worker status and with the IRCC coordinating with the IRCC to issue uh, to have a, a speedy visa processing for seafarers who need to join the vessels in Canada. And we also see that with this trade unions keep lobbying and keep um, reading the request with the uh, CIBS, IRCC, Transport Canada, they all respond to such requests and to ensure that international seafarers could have um, crew exchange uh, rights in Canada and shore leave rights with restrictions basically to ensure the uh, local community's health and safety as well. And for domestic Canadian seafarers, um, trade unions um, uh, initiate a labor arbitration to ask for um, shore leave rights. But that arbitration, um, in that arbitration, I was invited as an uh, expert witness to, uh, to basically prove how important shore leave is for seafarers' mental and physical health. But so far, it seems to be delayed. So I can see that the trade union working hard to get sea international seafarers crew exchange rights in short in Canada to get seafarers uh, shore leave rights, even though with some restrictions. And they also trying to lobby at different levels of government to get seafarers priority in vaccines. So, but the issue is that even though trade union has done so much. And when we have a provincial, at the provincial level, um, a union representing federal workers, how much they could do to uh, intervene provincial levels policies, I would say it's very challenging. And uh, in, in this case, for example, like Newfoundland has this kind of uh, restriction on the seafarers or other rotational workers signing off from their duties, return home to have such kind of quarantine requirement. I think sometimes it's a time to revisit these policies because if, if a seafarer working on board for more than 14 days in a confined and isolated environment and uh, uh, being sent home through a chartered uh, taxi or chartered car, with a driver have a negative uh, COVID-19 test, could he or she still need to go through this 14-day quarantine again? So it's basically isolation after isolation. So sometimes I think that is something beyond the trade union's capability, even though they put all these facts on the table, but how the policymakers respond to that is very unpredictable. And sometimes we can see that is not very friendly. The, the, the policy, the quarantine policy, this requirement are not very friendly to seafarers and as well as other essential workers. Yeah. Okay, and we have a question from Steve that I think could really go to both of you. Um, and it's, uh, we'll see if Robert wants to comment on policy. But from the policy perspective, how can we improve the understanding of the workers' compensation boards of the actual work environment during the return to work process? 
as you shared, decide with the example of the worker with a broken leg being told to return to work as a seafarer. It doesn't really fit. Um, but maybe we'll start with Robert. Do you want to reflect on that, Robert? Yeah, in terms of the actual work environment during the return to work process, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I know you have, or maybe I'm getting mixed up with the second question more about work accommodation. Um, in terms of the work environment, I don't know if it's fully as understood or as understood as it should be from like the perspective of the kind of the physicians and their side of the, the claim process. Um, I don't know, it's, I think from other research there's been, a, there's, there's been suggestions of a bit of a disconnect between like what, what they suggest you should be able to do and what the actual work environment is really like. Um, I feel like people in claims management, if a claim gets that far where it needs a claims manager, they probably have a better idea and they kind of navigate between the medical advice, the worker and the employer. But I don't know in terms of how they gain information, like what specific information they gain in terms of the work environment during that process. I don't know. I feel like uh, that's something I, should, I need to learn more about, obviously. Um, but then maybe speaking to someone in claims management um, would be appropriate for that. Yeah, and again, I would just refer people back to Dana's presentation in the last webinar, where yeah. in the particularly in the case of mobile workers, the, the the failure to take into account the transportation aspects that are inherent in that kind of work, as well as uh, the sort of being absent from family and so on and so forth. So there's there are a bunch of layers here, particularly when we're talking about mobile workers. Decide you want to reflect on this. Yeah, I, I, yeah. in terms of workers' compensation for seafarers, yeah, so it's a yeah. complicated area. It's a very complicated area because um, at this time when I interviewed the uh, human resource manager in the shipping company, I asked them, um, is the workers' compensation uh, basically in your headquarters, uh, the company's registration uh, area or at the seafarer's residence area. So basically, they basically told me that is uh, their uh, company's province workers' compensation board will in charge of this uh, workers' compensation compensation of the seafarers. So that makes the situation further complicated. Imagine a seafarer living in, let's say, um, Ontario and work for a shipping company registered in Nova Scotia. And when uh, he or she need to return to work, need to work with the uh, Nova Scotian Workers' Compensation Board. But the local doctors, he, he could have, have it in Ontario. And how to, first thing is that the Workers' Compensation Board also need to have an understanding about certain special uh, employments that may need extra medical requirements at the federal level. And secondly, is when they have this kind of remote area and Ontario doctors work with workers' compensation board in Nova Scotia, and could they have effective communication? So sometimes that's why when the workers' compensation board, they insist probably earlier return to work with help the employees, but not necessarily in any industry. So when I read the workers' compensation board's materials or training materials on return to work, it's more like a general principle. So it's basically assumed that uh, with limitations, physical limitations, uh, still the employer has the capacity to arrange alternative jobs. But in some industry, probably that is not the case. So in that case, I would say with the workers' compensation board, they need to understand certain hazardous or challenging working environment may have a higher uh, physical requirement for the workers to return to work. And there's, uh, again, a last, uh, that's the question you were looking at, Robert, the last one from Steve. Are there any assessment tools to assess the employer's readiness to accommodate disabled workers? So it's not specific to, to mobile workers, but I don't know if you have thoughts on that, either of you. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if, the, what assessment, if there are assessment tools or what they are. Um, 
yeah i don't i don't have a good answer for that but it's, it's also trying to think about the is it in the interest of the employer to have the worker back to work you know even if they are um you know through modified duties even if they're sitting in a room doing something which is almost meaningless because it might cost you know it might cost less or might get back to work sooner um but in terms of assessing the readiness to accommodate them i i don't and i i don't know enough about like how that's determined. Sai, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, it's in a way the return to work research yeah. is really just starting for you, right? Yeah, I think the uh, assessment tools to assess employers' readiness, I, to my knowledge, I don't know. And um, what I can see is that the employers basically what they do is that in the shipping industry it's more like this is a job here and uh, we can't provide um, alternative jobs for you on board full stop so that is more more like the, the so far the knowledge i have but so to provide a, alternative jobs or the jobs with some limitations probably that is something beyond the shipping industry's um, current current situation, yeah. Catherine, do you have anything else you want to ask about? I just want to react to Steve's question because it's a good question. I don't know the answer to the question, but what in light of what we've heard and particularly the size presentation, but the literature that I know, there are some workplaces that are, it's more reasonable to expect them to accommodate than others. And, you know, if you have a worker with a broken leg and you want to put that person back on a ship that's going to be gone for three months, um, I have a feeling any reasonable person would say, well, that's not a good idea, except that policies um, sometimes, depending on the jurisdiction, don't, uh, in your best judgment, uh, give that kind of wiggle room to the people applying the policies. They're basically algorithms and talk, talk, talk. Okay, you should, you have broken leg, you should be going back and even you can't do this, but you can do that. Um, and the, the, what it made me think, Steve's question in light of both the, the situation that Desai shows us, which I think any reasonable person if interviewed would say, no, we wouldn't want to send somebody back in those circumstances, but how are these decisions made? Are they made by people or by computers? That can vary from one jurisdiction to the next. And a similar type of issue was very well studied by Joe Neakin and Ellen McKechn in small workplaces, um, where if you have three employees in a mechanics shop, sending one back for light work is not necessarily going to improve the quality of the working relationships because it's a very different dynamic then if you have 300 people and the person can go back and it, it's not going to interfere with the work that's being done or um, create a, a weight on the on an economic weight for the employer um, who would probably need a new mechanic because they, they can't function because they've got somebody who uh, is missing. So I think the question, I don't, I don't know the answer to the question. Maybe there are people who are participating who might know more literature than I do on this, but I think it's a really important question. Um, but I also think it's a really interesting field of research, which we have yet to articulate, um, is the, the, how much discretion do the people applying the policy actually have and how much are decisions made by algorithm? in which case um, there's not a lot of human interaction as to whether this idea of sending somebody back to a ship with a broken leg, whether that makes sense. If you asked anybody probably working in some workers' compensation systems, they would say, no, of course it doesn't make sense. But maybe, I don't know, maybe people aren't being asked, maybe it's the computer and we haven't written in working conditions on ships into the algorithm. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there because I, I think the question is good. And I don't know literature that would answer, and I don't know everything, obviously, but um, I've been working on return to work probably longer than Robin and Desai, and I, I don't know the answer to that, you know, about if anybody is studying employers overall in terms of assessment tools, as opposed to doing qualitative interviews, like with small workplaces, like the work that uh, Joan and Ellen did um, at the time. So I, I didn't want to interrupt, but anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. 
Okay, well, it's 4.15 in Newfoundland. <laughs> and it's uh, Thursday before a long weekend, I think, for a lot of people. So uh, I think I would like to thank our presenters. I think they did an excellent job. And then thank our participants very much for, uh, for your interest in this webinar. Uh, just a reminder that, uh, that it has been recorded and it will be posted to the, the uh, website for this project, the Policy and Practice and Return to Work, uh, based at the University of Ottawa. And there will be an evaluation that will be circulated after the, uh, the webinar. And we'd be very interested in, in your comments and reflections. And finally, there is another webinar coming up. I think it's May 18th, and um, that is on access to medical care among international uh, workers and migrant or mobile workers within Canada. So we hope uh, we'll see some of you back. Uh, and thanks very much uh, to everyone for, uh, for a, a really interesting and important uh, webinar. Thank you, everybody. Barb and Desai and Robert um, from me as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Barb. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Barb. And it was a really great opportunity. Really good questions as well. Very interesting material. So it's been lovely to see you again and we'll see you soon. And hopefully for the 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 mobile worker medical access, I think that might have some. It's qualitative, but it might be quite interesting to put it together with your data bank because it, it, it tells a story that I look forward to hearing. I'm not quite sure what the story is, but I know there is one. Absolutely, yeah. It's always it's good to get the get a perspective from outside of what the numbers look like in the data. Okay. All right. Well, take good care and thank you so much. Still morning, maybe in BC? Oh no, it's just just after Ten lunch. More minutes. Ten more minutes of morning, and then it's lunchtime. So. So. Yeah. I'm going to sign off, but thank you all very much for your help. And merci Monique aussi. And we'll see you soon.